I am recording. So I want to welcome everyone. I'm super privileged today to have the butterfly lady, Suzanne Tilton, with us. And uh, she's joining us by phone today. She was uh, recently um, in Texas, where her home is. And unfortunately, the, the, uh, the, our hurricane did not cooperate here. And so she's uh, without <laughs> internet. So I'm super uh, grateful to her and uh, her family to allow her to continue to join us today. Thank you so much for being here. I am so happy to be here and, and talk about monarchs. Well, I am too. Um, I have a Monarch Way station. I'm one of 30,000 here in the United States. And I've got lots of hungry caterpillars that are munching on my milkweed. <laughs> so um, I noticed today they're getting really, really fat. And I have a question for you about that. You know, okay. the first year I planted two swamp milkweed plants, just two. And I was literally carrying baby caterpillars from one to the other because they completely ate it to the ground, um, the first one. And I'm just wondering how much milkweed does one caterpillar eat during their life cycle? Do you have any idea? Oh, boy. That's the million-dollar question. Uh, as you know, they are voracious eaters. And I tell everyone you can never have too much milkweed. The more, the better. I, I, and I would say, uh, you know, a plant, it, it, it depends on the milkweed because you have all different types of milkweed. But uh, if you have tropical milkweed in a pot, probably one foot of tropical milkweed or maybe swamp milkweed, uh, one medium sized swamp milkweed might feed two. A uh, common milkweed, one large common milkweed might feed four. So maybe that gives you a little bit of judgment. Okay, great. But then I can, I can never judge accurately. I, I'll tell you a story, true story. Uh, living in Florida at the time a few years ago, and we had a home with a lanai, which is a screen porch, and a swimming pool. And at the time, I was uh, raising monarch caterpillars in this lanai. I had plants all around the swimming pool. And I was teaching at the time, and I came home from school, and to my horror, all the milkweed was gone. There, it was all gone. And there were 50 caterpillars who had crawled off the milkweed and found their way to the edge of the pool and were wandering around the edge of the pool. So, yeah, so I had to quickly gather them all up, put them in a container, and ran to my nearby native nursery and get some more uh, milkweed. Uh, True so story. You, you've suffered from the same thing I have. Would you come out and you're like, oh, you <laughs> ate all your food. What am I going to do? <laughs> yeah. Yep. It happens to the best of us. Everyone who has raised monarchs, this has happened to them. Trust me. <laughs> good to know. I, I'm in good company for sure. So um, I am going to forward your slides here. I just wanted to um, start with this John Sawhill quote. I thought that was really beautiful. So you want to uh, talk about it? Yes, I do. I, b before we start, I want everyone to realize that the monarch population is not so much in peril as the monarch migration is in peril. There will always be monarchs. They've been around for millions of years. They're very resilient and very adaptable. In fact, the monarch scientists believe started in Mexico. And when they ran out of milkweed, they started to move north because they found in the prairies here in North America, lots of milkweed. So they loved it. They made it their way to the prairies and to the northern part of North America, found all this milkweed. But they are tropical butterflies and they don't like the cold. And it started to get cold. And so they started to move south again. And they think that's how the migration of the monarchs from uh, Mexico to Canada started. Monarchs have actually are live around the world. I lived on an island of Tonga where there were monarchs there in Australia, New Zealand, uh, Africa, even Spain, all over South America and Central America. So we will always have monarchs with us. But what's in peril here in North America and Mexico is the loss of these migrating, this migration, this great migration, which is a beauty to behold. And if we aren't careful, uh, in fact, uh, in California, there's two sets of uh, 
monarchs that migrate. There's a Western set and an Eastern set. So they are afraid that the Western migration is almost over. Because I think about 10 years ago, uh, when they started, I, I think in 1994, when they started uh, measuring, there were 1.2 million monarchs that would migrate along and uh, hibernate or, or overwinter along the shores of uh, Northern California. And now that's down to like about, I think the last count um, this last winter was uh, less than 20,000. And so that is in peril. The same thing has happened. Eastern population, uh, when they started counting, it is down like 90%. And it went down again this year. And I'm sorry, I don't have the exact statistics in front of me. But uh, we need to do something to help save the monarch migration here in North America. Absolutely. So, I mean, this is something I became interested in, um, you know, when I uh, started that, you know, that started started my Monarch Way station. And certainly this year has been a really rough year. Um, so I was curious from your standpoint, you know, why do you think that at least on the East Coast where I live in central Pennsylvania, why do, um, why do you think the, the migration has been so impacted? You've talked about cold weather. Do you think that the cold, wet weather this spring had something to do with it? Definitely, exactly, because they, they do things based on weather. And if you remember, there in the East Coast, there was a lot, it was colder than usual and a lot of wet weather right during the migration. And so I'm assuming, and I, I've heard others say that they believe that the weather has affected the migration on the Eastern Coast. Now in the Midwest and uh, Northern part of Canada, they're seeing lots of monarchs. So they made their way, but they just, I think they just skipped over some of the Eastern states. Yeah. But I, they I, probably will head back. They'll probably start heading back in August and September. Well, I, I certainly hope so. Um, I did feel like, you know, when I looked back, you know, my Facebook, a month, you know, this time last year, I already had butterflies that were hatching. Um, I finally have my first one that is, uh, has created a chrysalis. That was a couple days ago and I got to uh, actually video it, um, creating. It, <laughs> yeah, I so saw you exciting. posted that. That was a wonderful video. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really super exciting. So I, I really, um, you know, I really, it's so much fun to watch and, and share that with, you know, friends and family and, and obviously on my page. But um, I, you know, from your perspective, you know, homeowners play a big role in being able to help the migration. So, you know, do you Absolutely. want to talk a little bit about what are some things that people can do to help with the migration and, and make sure that they have a, a successful migration back to their Mexican overwintering grounds? Yes, I would love to do that. Uh, one person, one individual can make a huge impact. So the very first thing, the most important thing that anyone can do is to plant milkweed. Milkweed is the only plant that monarchs will use to lay their eggs. And uh, Dr. Chip Taylor of Monarch Watch, who established the way station program, says to assure a future for monarchs, conservation and restoration of milkweeds needs to become a national priority. So we need to plant milkweed. There are lots of milkweeds. There are over, I think, 70 species of milkweed here in uh, North America. Some are more common than others. And so um, Heather does a really good job of teaching about native plants and native milkweeds. So find out what milkweed is native in your area and plant that. And fall is the best time. Fall and winter is the best time to plant native species of milkweed. I would agree. I, I certainly, um, you know, have two different types of milkweed and a butterfly weed growing in my yard, um, both the swamp milkweed, uh, the common milkweed, and then I have the orange butterfly weed. You know, I'm curious, in, in your area, what milkweeds do you see growing in Texas? Well, Texas, they have, uh, it's a huge state, so it depends on what part of the state you're in. 
uh, they have what is called an antelope horn milkweed. And this, they call it that because the, um, the seed pods look like the horns of antelope. Oh, cool. And I that is that. a native here. The uh, butterfly, uh, Slepheus tuberosa, which you call butterfly weed, is also native here. Uh, and uh, showy milkweed or a Slepheus syriaca will be, uh, you can probably find in the northwestern part of, you know, of Texas. Here in the south, actually, uh, tropical milkweed is a native because we are right along the border of Mexico. And uh, tropical milkweed is a native to Mexico. So here in the south part of Texas, uh, probably you see more tropical milkweed than anything else. That's interesting. So I know that there's some controversy on the tropical milkweed. It obviously blooms for a very long time and there's certainly concern that if you are not, it's not a native to you, should you be planting that? Well, um, I think you should have all kinds of milkweed. The more milkweed, the better, the more different species. Tropic, I grow tropical milkweed in containers so I control it. I will uh, cut off the seed pods because I know by cutting off the seed pods, uh, and this is true for any milkweed, by removing the seed pods or removing the dead flowers, actually deadheading the flowers. But if the seed pods start to form, I will cut those off too. It will elongate the blooming time of the milkweed. Um, also, it will prevent uh, milkweed bugs from getting onto your milkweed because they like to uh, eat the uh, inside and lay their eggs inside those pods. Another, the biggest issue with uh, tropical milkweed is uh, it doesn't die back like native milkweeds. So what is suggested by uh, the National Association of, of Butterflies is that you cut your milk. So if you're growing tropical milkweed, cut it back in the fall, cut it back. In fact, I think it's a good, um, good technique is just to cut it back as it starts to get leggy or when the caterpillars have eaten it, cut it all the way back about five inches. That does two things. It, um, it, it will uh, help your, your plant to bloom and grow better. But also the biggest problem, I don't really want to talk about it too much because this, we could really go off, but it, it, uh, because in the south it doesn't die back, OE spores accumulate on the milkweed and that's probably the the um, biggest source of concern for tropical right. milkweed. We don't so if you cut it back frequently, that prevents that from happening. And I know there was some, um, some scientific work being done on common milkweed, which by the way, smells fantastic. A lot of oh. people here in the Northeast love to grow it because it reminds oh, me. Oh, it's intoxicating. It. Yeah. It yeah, is so great. Um, but you know, those, ba those baby caterpillars and certainly the mama uh, butterflies, like those tender small leaves, not those big, yeah. thick, leathery leaves, right? So do you think it's a exactly good idea to cut them back? Absolutely. Late uh, mid-June to late June, now's the time. If you have common milkweed, they do say, uh, there is, you're right, there's a study out of, I think, Michigan saying to cut it back. And um, this actually, I actually uh, witnessed this living in North Carolina. There was a farmer who had a, a field of milkweed that he let me go in and harvest eggs and caterpillars. And I noticed one summer he cut it back all the way down. I think it was in June or July and I was devastated. I thought, oh no, all the milkweed is gone. But it quickly grew back and I was shocked. I think it was the mid of August that it was just covered with uh, monarchs and eggs, laying their eggs because they do like, they prefer those fresh new um, leaves for their babies because one, it's easier for the little tiny caterpillars to chew and also there's less uh, latex from the leaves that the tiny caterpillars have to deal with. Oh, that's a good point. I didn't even think about the less latex. Uh, so that makes sense to me for sure. Well, I, I did do that. I did uh, chop all mine down after it finished blooming. Obviously I look for eggs, um, but I cut it back by half and uh, that was about two weeks ago and I'm already seeing those new leaves uh, emerge. Oh. Good. All right. Well, you're a testament of that, Tim. <laughs> so it does work for sure. So um, can you talk to us as well about what things would be natives and maybe rebloomers? I certainly recognize that a lot of people don't have a lot of time 
and maybe they would like to have something that would come back year after year. Are there native yeah. flowers that you find that the monarchs prefer? Because we need to give them fuel too, right? Yes, that's right. And that's actually number two on what to do to help a monarch is to plant a garden. Because the most effective way to boost monarch population is really simple, is plant a garden. And the garden can be just a, 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 you know, the end of your driveway, the little verge on the end of your driveway, it can be a container or it can be a field. It doesn't have to be that big. And all you need to do is just plant some, some native flowers. Uh, some of the best native perennials for monarchs other than milkweed, of course, you have to have milkweed. And the, the good thing about milkweed, I didn't mention this, but not only do the monarchs lay their eggs for their caterpillars, but the blooms create a great deal of fuel for the monarchs. So they, they do fuel up on the nectar from the milkweed flowers. Asters, especially asters bloom in the fall are a wonderful fall blooming native. Goldenrod is another, they are very dependent on goldenrod. It grows along the the coastal areas and so as they travel south along the coast and down to florida along the coast to mexico they're very dependent on golden rods uh there's a lot of native sunflowers bee balm uh up there in the northeast bee balm is a wonderful flower joe pie weed uh one of my favorites is ironweed i love ironweed there's a lot of different species of ironweed uh anise hyssop and coneflower uh, monarchs love coneflowers, let's see, sedum, and just about any blooming, you know, native flower is going to provide some kind of nectar for your monarchs. Absolutely. Now, um, and as Heather will tell you, the fall is the best time to plant uh, your native perennials. If right now you're you're wanting to attract butterflies, there are certain flowers you could probably buy at a nursery or plant very quickly. Zinnias, it, you, you can go out and just throw zinnias in the ground and you might get um, I, you know, some blooming by the fall for the monarch. Lantana, there are um, some lantanas better than others, but they, they love lantana. My favorite for the Northeast is Miss Huff because it is a perennial and it will bloom throughout uh, spring, summer, and fall, and the monarchs love it. Another annual that's easy to grow is Tasonia, or Mexican sunflower, and that is a magnet for monarchs, as well as other butterflies. Um, cosmos is another very easy, you just throw the seed in the ground and the cosmos will come up. Uh, any kinds of verbena, I think monarchs particularly like the tall verbena. Don't ask me to say the scientific name. It's too difficult for me. <laughs> Heather could probably say it. <laughs> well, I agree with you on the Mexican sunflower. So I got introduced uh, that by the local master gardeners uh, several years ago. Uh, this lady had this big Save the Monarchs poster up and she was giving away Mexican sunflower seeds. And she literally like shoved them in our hands when she saw that we were um, buying some of the milkweed. And I'm like, okay, okay. And she said, just crunch that head up. And I'm like, okay, what do I have to lose? Well, do you know that Mexican sunflower that first year was like an umbrella and it was over four and a half feet tall. It was unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah. So I learned very quickly that if you're going to grow Tithonia or Mexican sunflower, you definitely need to buy some really big, really sturdy stakes. And mine are just now getting to that height where they need to be staked. Um, my groundhog finds them very delicious. So I have to cover them with netting. Otherwise, he likes to eat them to the ground. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my enough. gosh. No, I've never experienced that. Oh. <laughs> You, yeah. you can grow them in a large, you can grow them in a large container. And when you do so, that kind of stunts their growth. And I do understand that there are smaller varieties of uh, Mexican sunflowers. But it is, I agree with you. I had a woman once, I was giving a presentation in North Carolina at a, a group of gardeners, garden club. And one woman, she's the one who actually brought me in. She had contacted me. She said, I don't have any butterflies. I have this, I have that, I have this. I said, well, plant some Tithonia and see what happens. And oh my gosh, she came back. She was a believer. She said, it wasn't until I planted the Mexican sunflower that I started seeing butterflies. 
Yeah, it, it's definitely a magnet and it makes a great cut flower too. And you'll have plenty oh, yeah. for you and mine last year, I grew an entire like row of them and they've self seeded this year. So I needed not worry. That oh, my dog could that's eat wonderful. Yeah. So oh, that's wonderful. So I'm super, super happy and well, beautiful. Let, let's stop right there because you said something. And I think this is what we have to understand when we're gardeners. When we create habitat for butterflies, we're also creating habitat for other pollinators, uh, for bees and other butterflies. We're also creating habitat for birds because birds eat the caterpillars. Many birds are um, carnivores and eat caterpillars. I know we don't like to hear that, but we like our birds. And some of the, the flowers, like the tithonia, I think the, uh, oh, what is it? The gold, one of the goldfinches love to eat the petals of the, uh, the, the sunflowers. And so when we create, ha and, and like you said, you've got, you know, some people this year have been complaining about the rabbits coming in and eating. But you have to understand that when you create habitat, wildlife habitat, you're going to have all kinds of, ha of wildlife. And that's exactly what we're striving for. I completely agree. I, I joked early this spring when I had no butterflies, but I had turtles. I had nine turtles so far <laughs> this year. I'm like, clearly I planted a turtle crop. <laughs> that, that was such a thing, but I did that. Um, but I agree with you. I um, have been super fortunate to attract a lot of native bees. And so especially the first round of common milkweed, you couldn't walk out there and there would be 40 or 50 bees easily in the milkweed patch um, taking that nectar up. And I think one thing you want to think about is creating sort of a symphony of blooms that start in early spring for the bees and then continue on through the late fall as these not only monarchs but migratory birds are looking yes. for food. And what I didn't know is that migratory birds lose 50% of their body weight overnight. So those caterpillars are serving a giant need. I like to call them nature's hot dogs, but they <laughs> give us those pretty colorful feathers because they're full of carotenoids. So remember how your mom always used to say, eat your carrots because it's good for your eyes? Well, we don't produce carotenoids <laughs> by ourselves. We have to get it from food. And so do our birds. So the birds prefer right. the caterpillars, especially nestlings. Do you know that net one nest of chickadees requires 400 caterpillars a day? Wow. So you're absolutely right. These flowers will attract the things that maybe we don't like as a gardener. We don't like to see things being eaten, but I consider my garden being eaten a sign of victory because I don't spray, <laughs> but I do grow the caterpillars. And if they're a nuisance like cabbage, I've had a lot of cabbage butterfly moths this year. Um, every morning I prepare a nice tray of caterpillars for my birds and they know and they start chattering when they see me start coming upstairs with uh, the caterpillars for them and they're gone oh they're that's gone. wonderful <laughs> so, yeah but, well um, and along that line you have to remember because you are creating this habitat for uh for wildlife for butterflies and birds and bees don't use pesticides that's the number, th the third thing that you need to remember it to help monarchs and other wildlife is don't, don't use pesticides because guess what? Pesticides will kill wildlife. 100%. And I think people sometimes forget that, that, you know, there are a lot of companies now that will come and spray your yard for mosquitoes, but those insecticides are non-selective and what you will find is that if you kill your mosquitoes, you're gonna kill everything else in your yard too. And um, I worked with a client who bought an eight acre farm down in Florida and he called me because when they moved into their new home, they were just being killed by mosquitoes. So they called the state and the state sent a helicopter and the helicopter sprayed. And he was like, called me, he goes, I think I made a mistake. He's like, there's no more butterflies. There's no." Yeah birds 
And I said, yeah, unfortunately you've killed their food source. So, you know, until that insecticide dies down, you know, you're not going to see anything in your yard anymore. Yeah. So yeah. That, unfortunately that's true. People, when I lived in Florida, um, I was able to contact the mosquito spraying company and they would tell me when they were going to be coming into my neighborhood so that I could uh, bring everything inside and protect it from the, the mosquito spray. And they will do that if, if you live in Florida, you can contact them and, and they will advise you when they're coming. And I'm sure that's probably true anywhere they do mosquito spraying. That's really good to know. And certainly I've found that if you will plant pollinator hedgerows full of the plants that you're suggesting, the good bugs come in and there's very little bad bugs left. So I have an army that helps me out there with the bad bug population. Oh, exactly. Your ladybugs, your lace wings are wonderful for, for taking away those aphids. And you're exactly right. So don't despair when you see something on your milkweed that you don't recognize. It might be a beneficial uh, bug for that, that, that plant. Absolutely. So um, I don't get too excited when I start seeing these other critters show up on the on the milkweed. So you've got a fantastic peach picture here, Suzanne, of people. It looks like they're capturing and recording the milkweed. I mean, sorry, <laughs> the monarchs. Can you talk yeah, to me well, a little bit about tagging? Yes. So another way that we can really become involved in helping the monarchs the migrant monarch population is by becoming a citizen scientist. We, ha we all have the capability to help in many different ways. And one way is by tagging. And what they do starting in August, people will go out and capture wild monarchs and place little tags. Uh, monarch Watch provides these tags if you're interested. And they put the tag on a, a certain part of the wing and then when the monarch migrates down to Mexico, there are people there that when they find these monarchs with the tags will report it to Monarch Watch and they keep track of these tags. It gives them a lot of information. In fact, it was a tagging program in 1975 that actually helped uh, scientists find exactly where the uh, monarchs were migrating in Mexico. Before that, they didn't have any idea. And because someone found a monarch with a tag, they were able to, to prove that those butterflies from Canada were flying all the way to Mexico. Uh, also, people who raise butterflies will tag, and that gives them a lot of excellent scientific information. Of, uh, I've had friends who's tagged a butterfly in Florida who interestingly enough ended up in Mexico. So they find out all kinds of information from those tags. Uh, there are other ways that you can, if you're not interested in catching a butterfly and putting a tag on it, you can go to Journey North website and there you can report when you see a monarch. And it's very easy, you just sign up for a little account and you click on their map and you say, I saw an adult monarch or I saw an egg today. And, and you report your findings and they collect that data and helps them to see how healthy and how well the population is doing. Uh, another thing, um, also the Western population has a, a exercise society in the West has a tagging problem, uh, program too for the Western part of the United States. They, Scientists consider there to be two populations of monarchs, Western and Eastern, um, but they do occasionally converge in Mexico or cross the Rockies, but typically they, they uh, gather information and, and treat each uh, population differently. Right now, uh, there's a monarch blitz going on and you can participate in that. They just want you to go out and, and start counting uh, the monarchs and caterpillars and eggs that you see and reporting that started I think July 24th and goes to August 4th so if you want to just you know type monarch blitz in your browser and you'll find it on the on July 4th the National Association for Butterflies they have a 4th of July butterfly count that uh, 
they also collect information on monarchs from that. Uh, so there's, uh, there's another project, a uh, larva monitoring project, where you can count eggs and larva. There's just all kinds of things like that that you can do as an individual to gather data for scientists. And that data that you gather as an individual is very useful and helpful to scientists. Absolutely. So you, you, you actually mentioned several different um, websites here. So I'm going to port a, a post those here in the comments for those that are backstage. And I can certainly um, add a document uh, to our Facebook as well, um, such that, you know, people can see what we've got going on. But, you know, you also help individuals um, with um, creating a monarch way station and, and, and how to do that. You want to talk a little yes. bit about your course? Yes. So I, I, I feel it's my mission in life to educate not myself and others about butterflies, because I truly believe that if we connect with these butterflies, we will see their intrinsic value. And when we see their intrinsic value, we will be more likely to protect them and create habitat for them. So I reach out to people through a Facebook page to teach them about monarchs and about butterflies in general. But I, 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 this summer I focus quite a bit on monarchs. And I teach a course on how to raise, I say the name of the course is Raising Monarchs for Fun. But in the course, there are seven lessons. I run it for uh, a week. The lessons cover, uh, talk about a lot of the information that we've covered here all about monarchs, the things you can uh, plant in your garden to attract monarchs, how to raise them so that you raise healthy caterpillars and healthy butterflies, uh, and different ways that you, what you can do. I also have a whole lesson on the way station that Heather has talked about. The way station is basically a way to create habitat for monarchs. And uh, so, through my course, hopefully people will become excited about monarchs, even if they don't want to raise them, uh, they learn a lot about monarchs. I think that if you have children or grandchildren, one of the most valuable thing that you can teach your children and, and experience you can give them is to teach them about the life cycle of a butterfly and the, the Children, this is actually how I got connected with butterflies. I was teaching at risk four and five year olds in Southern Florida. And one of the teachers had created a, a butterfly habitat, a butterfly garden. And my kids were over there all the time, just entranced with, with what was going on. And so I started to learn. And then I, I remember bringing a butterfly or a caterpillar in the classroom and we watched it. And this whole process turned my children on to learning and I've seen it over and over and over again. I have, I have a teacher friend that I brought uh, in Tonga who's teaching at risk children in Tonga and who wouldn't read. And we started bringing butterflies into the classroom and they became so enthralled that they started, we, we couldn't find enough books on monarchs for them to read. So this is a wonderful way a, a gift to give to children is, is to teach them about the, these these amazing creatures. I completely agree. I think it's a wonderful way to get people involved in nature too and get them outside. And certainly in time where, that we're in right now, it's a very safe activity to do in your backyard. Um, I know I get questions about the bees and the nice thing about native bees is they really are not aggressive whatsoever, unlike a honeybee that has been imported. And so I knock on wood have never been stung in my yard by any kind of bee. Um, so, you know, you just need to tell, tell them not to catch them. And, and certainly, you know, if you see a bee getting aggressive, just back away. Um, but I right. you know, rarely happens, but certainly butterflies are, you know, they, they're they sometimes hard to catch as a photographer. Uh, I find them sometimes very uh, <laughs> like drunk when they first get to my, they're so happy <laughs> flittering around everywhere. We have a couple of questions um, for you, Suzanne, um, about, you know, Sandra's and her family teach their children not to touch the butterflies. Um, his, her husband does a gentle release with, um, in his hands. What are your thoughts about, you know, monarchs or other butterflies you might be raising? 
what's the best way to release them so you don't injure them? Um, butterflies are actually quite durable. They are actually not as fragile as we think they are. Butterflies on their wings have scales. And so a lot of people believe that if you rub the wings of the butterfly, the scales come off and it will hurt the butterfly. You can actually take your hand, and I don't suggest you do this, but just a point. If you rub all those scales off the wing, the butterfly will still be able to fly. You don't want to do that. But the point is, yes, touch that butterfly, hold that butterfly in your hand. That's how you're going to make a connection. So when you release a butterfly, it's certainly fine if you have it in a container, you have it somewhere to reach your hand in it. And, and when the wings are closed, you, you grab it with both your thumb and your, your middle finger or your pinky so you don't squeeze it too tight or even your forefinger and pull it out and place it on the hand of a child and let them experience that. That's not going to hurt the butterfly, um, believe it or not. And so I, I, I'm of the, the, the opinion that it is fine to touch them. Now, if you go to a butterfly exhibit, they don't want you to touch the butterflies and that's for a reason. They're trying to preserve these butterflies for others and so they don't want you touching them uh, and damaging them. They want these butterflies to live as long as possible. But also because many of these butterflies are tropical butterflies and they don't want you taking anything that they might have outside of that habitat into a native habitat. Right, or vice versa, you contaminating right. your hands for sure. Absolutely. Right. Um, one other question that we're getting is that it sounds like Texas might be giving out seeds. Do you have a source for someone if they're looking for seeds? Well, actually, I have a lot of common milkweed seed and tropical milkweed seed that I'd be more than glad to give away. Um, if you, uh, let's see, the uh, best way probably is to email me, uh, or let's see, if you send me a self-addressed self -addressed envelope, and what I, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have my, do I have my address? I have a new address and I don't have it. I have a PO box. I will give that to Heather so that she can post it on her Facebook page. Sure. And you're welcome to send me a self-addressed envelope and I will send you some common milkweed seeds. And if you want tropical milkweed seed, I'll send you those too. Absolutely. So what I would recommend, if you all will drop your email addresses into the chat, I will record those and I will, and Suzanne will send you um, a message that you can send the uh, your self address stamped envelope to, and she can uh, share that with you. So if that works, yes. okay, I think that's probably that, the way to handle that. How does that sound? Yeah, and there's also in uh, I will also share there's other organizations that in the spring will give away a lot of milkweed seed to people who have large uh, uh, gardens, school gardens, or golf courses, or our prairie like. Uh, our farms and they do give away free huge amounts of seed that way. Perfect. Sandra says her family has released 50 so far. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Oh, Sandra. that's wonderful. That is so awesome. Um, I'm also going to drop in the chat um, the um, some resources that I've used and I've directed people to. If you're looking for native plants that are specific to your zip code, Doug Tallamy, if you've not read his books, I 100% recommend them, um, called Nature's Best Hope, and he's talking about us. Um, he has uh, created, with the National Wildlife uh, Federation, a plant guide, a native plant guide specific to your zip code. Not only can you plant, print it off and save it, but it tells you the native plant nurseries in your area that might carry those particular plants. So all those beautiful pictures that Suzanne shared with us, this would be potentially a source. So I'm gonna drop that to you. And thank you for everybody that's dropping their email into the chat. I will, um, I will um, we'll share that, uh, excuse me, I will um, send you uh, that information. And I have a common and swamp milkweed. So again, we're happy to send those as well, not a problem. Um, my common is just now producing seeds, so I will uh, save those seeds this year for you. 
Um, but I will drop that. The other two that you mentioned um, briefly, Suzanne, were the Xerces Society. And then another yes. one I can use if you're a birder is Audubon. And Audubon yes, definitely. not only tells you if the plant attracts bees and butterflies, but it also tells you which birds are more likely to frequent those plants. So um, that can help you if you're a birder too. Um, the last thing I dropped in the chat was an article I wrote recently. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the call, I recently took a thousand mile round trip uh, down to see my family in North Carolina. And um, I saw 10 butterflies on my trip and it was very concerning and worrisome to me. So I wrote about it recently on a website called Medium. You can access that for free, but it will talk to you about why I, like Suzanne, am super passionate about teaching people about native pollinator and wildlife gardens. So um, feel free to um, save this chat um, or uh, copy and paste it into your own document. And I will make sure all of these resources that Suzanne has talked about um, are included in a document for our, uh, our guests here today on my website, Garden Thoughtfully. So um, Suzanne, any uh, final words uh, that you have or concerns that, you know, things that you would like people to know? Um, well, uh, I could talk for hours, so, but <laughs> I, I think um, uh, we've done a pretty good job of covering some of the basic things to, for, to help people to get started in creating habitat. And that's, I just want to say, once you get started, it becomes a passion and it will change your life. I completely agree. And certainly, um, you know, we are very, very grateful to all of you. And we would love for you, if you have social media, this will be available on my page as well as Suzanne page, which is the Butterfly Lady. I highly recommend you subscribe to both because we both put great updates about things that I think you'll be interested in. But the really the best thing we can do as gardeners and as people who love butterflies is to teach others. And so um, one initiative I'm working on this fall is pollinator um, corridors. So I'm talking to my neighbors about planting plants to help this fall migration. And we're even looking at doing a plant giveaway because I have things like um, my anise hyssop uh, that is going completely crazy at the moment. And I, I'm running out of room for it. So, <laughs> so I hope you like this. If you, <laughs> Uh, we'd love to do more of these for you. So let us know what you'd like to learn more about. We'll be glad to do another one. Thank you so much, Suzanne, for joining me. I really appreciate it. All right. Thank here. you for inviting me. It's Thank my you pleasure. So much. Thank you to all the attendees today and uh, look forward to catching up with you soon. Take care. Bye.